Moving on to Viva and presenting. This is the last section. Um, and it's a pretty good one. So let's begin. So there's two ways that you can present something. One is a poster presentation, and the second is a PowerPoint presentation. PowerPoint presentation is usually gonna be your Vivas, and, um, and then for the poster presentation, you're gonna have at different conferences, etc. So let's start with the poster presentation. So this is a poster presentation. <laughs> this is my poster presentation for, uh, for a paper that I did recently. And um, a few things here, a few things to say about, a few tips. Number one, cut the clutter. So cut down as much as possible whatever you're saying. If you can, include it in diagrams, include it in tables, and cut down the number of words that you have on your slides. This is so important. As uh, Keep that to a minimum. Um, include graphs and illustrations. We've said this. We, we had a whole section about graphs and illustrations. You could go look at that. They're very important. I also always use an actionable suggestions panel. So I think you can see it here. So if someone comes to see my poster presentation, they know that, okay, if I read this action suggestions, this is the applicable part, what we said with the hypothesis at the beginning, at the first video. This is what the derivation of the applicable part of my hypothesis is. So if you, if you read my paper from my study, this is what I, the actionable suggestions are. Important and then follow the guidelines. I think there's, well, I'll say two more things here. One thing is, you can see that I made it into three columns here. Again, this was following the guidelines, but I think it's a pretty nice format. You include your introduction, and then you go to your methods, results, show your results. I have here qualitative and quantitative results. And then your conclusion, limitations, also include your limitations, references, Include the key reference. You don't have to include all the references. Include some key references, and you can use shortened versions of references. There's tools that do that for you. And contact information of basically your contact information. Um, okay, one last thing about posters. So when I went, when I, when you go and you present your poster presentation, if I'm honest with you, nobody really cares about that. Like they've come there to listen to the people that are doing the oral presentations, not you that you're doing your poster presentation. So you kind of have to get people's attention. You have to talk about, you, you want to also train your presenting skills, etc. So how do you do this? Recently went to a, to a conference and they had these new, uh, what are they? Like electronic posters. So there's like a big screen and then people write a code and your poster comes up and then they're not there, you don't go there with a the paper. And this is where I think most conferences are going to. And then what happens is you go there to the conference and you're waiting to present your presentation, but nobody, only if someone looks up for it, they'll find it and they'll see it. So nobody is really gonna see your presentation. So what I did was I went to one of these stations, I put in my code, presentation comes up, and I basically went up to people who were standing there and seeing, I was like, I'm going to present my presentation. Would you, my, my publication, or you know my research, would you care to listen to it? It's gonna be a two, three minute uh, presentation. And I went to different people and I gathered around me three to five people every time. I do this like three to five people, they'll come together, two, three to five doctors will come together and I'll be like, okay, and then I'll start presenting. Then when this happens, it has this, the audience effect. So more people come because they see people listening to you, more people come. So you got three to five minutes to present your presentation, you're presenting your, your paper, etc. You're practicing your skills of presentation, and then you're also making contacts. So what happened is, at some point, some one of the people that I told, he was very interested in, in my results as well and like my methodology and he liked how I presented and he was like, hey, here's my email. Send me an email, I'm doing a project on this and this and you might be interested. And this happened like two or three times. And that's pretty cool because then you also get to socialize when you're at a conference because it's pretty hard when you're a medical student going to a conference and you wanna socialize with all these doctors. You don't know really what to tell them. So this is one way to do that as well. So moving on, presentation. Um, let's see what we have here. Tell a story. People relate to stories. We love stories. Like one of the, the most influential books like the Bible, just they say stories. Um, you're more likely to remember a story than you're going to remember a statistical fact or 
uh, <laughs> statistical analysis or a graph because we that's how we learn that's how we're tuned to learn so with your presentation you have to tell a story um, and you have to tell a story that's that people can relate to or has emotion in it and we'll talk about that so again I will mention this again in another previous part but you present the problem the current solution the problems of the current solution and then your solution so this is what I did with my presentation I was like this is a little girl that has corneal blindness and because she has she has corneal blindness she can't walk to school she can't learn she can't have an education um, she can't be independent etc and all this different stuff and there's 12.7 million people around the world like her and then immediately you got people to empathize with this with this because you've made it you've made it personal you don't just say there's 12.7 million people around the world that have this disease etc no you went personal this little girl has this and this and this is how it affects her everyday life imagine you were at her age trying to learn trying to, trying to go to school and not being able to see you try and get people and then that's when you pull it out so you make it individual and then you pull it out and then you're like okay 12.7 million people like her wow okay you got you got them involved and then you're like 1.4 percent of these people only get treatment and they're like what 1.4 percent and then and then you're like, from those 1.4%, these are the treatment options, and this is why they're, they're not that good, and this is why only 1.4% of them get treatment. But I have my solution. Like, my solution, or what I hypothesized is that this is a better solution, and this is how we're going to help solve at least partially this problem. And then you immediately you got people engaged. Okay, tell me. Tell me more. How are you going to help solve corneal blindness? Um, and then again, this ties with, with our first, first thing that we talked about, hypothesis and aims, how your hypothesis is a novel and how it is applicable in the real world. And if you have those things, if you've ensured that your hypothesis has these two things, then all this different stuff, it goes, it goes like a train. It's like, uh, it's like a domino effect. You make sure that, that you have all this stuff and then the effect at the end is even more bigger. But if you don't have this stuff, then you're going to find it difficult later on down the line in order to supplement and you know build upon you need to have basically a good foundation all right so what's wrong with this slide um <laughs> this is this is kind of an ironic slide because it's it talks about effective presentations but it's <laughs> it's a crap slide um there's personally i i hate it when people do this like I, I'll be sitting in, uh, I'll be sitting and people will be presenting stuff. It's not, it's not their fault. This is how this is how we were taught to do presentations. But they'll just write, and you just have like chunks of text on the slide, which no one will read. Literally, no one will read that text. And then the worst thing is, people will try and read it, and because people are trying to read it, they will not listen to you. So at the end of the day, like you've lost them. They're not listening to you. They're just looking at the slide. Um, trying to understand what's going on uh, and at the end of the day, they, they don't go away with anything. We tend to remember very, very limited stuff from the people that, from the stuff that is presented to us. Very limited stuff. So, you, so I devised this rule of three. So this is, this is a rule of three. So, maximum three points, you can get away with four, but maximum three points per slide. Each point has a maximum of three words in it. Hopefully that goes through. Three points, maximum of three words on it. Example here, I've got a nice picture, I've got a title. Some slides don't even need a title because you have a title from before, just like I've done here. Um, so you can remove, remove stuff, remove as much stuff from declutter as much as slide, leave very limited stuff. And then you got your three points, accuracy, transparency, self viability, and then you talk about it. You don't have to write everything that you're talking about on the slide because it defeats the purpose of the presentation. Then you just, you know, just make it into a booklet and give it to them and they'll read it. You don't have to be there presenting it. So, rule of three. Next point. When I have these three, three points that I want to present or my graphs, etc., I use animations and shapes. These are so important. I, I spend quite a lot of time in, on my animations and shapes. Because someone might come up to me and be like, well, Andreas, you know, you know, three points are not enough for me. It's very complicated. I have, 
I have a great big table that has got loads of stuff that I want to talk about, etc. And I'm like, okay, listen, pick three of that stuff that you want to talk about um, on, on your slide. And this is, this is what I did. I have a big complicated table here. And I picked two stuff that I want to talk, there's like loads of stuff I could talk about this, but I picked two important ones because the people are not going to remember everything. Okay, going back to that. And I used my shapes and I was like, this is one, the orange one, I, I put that first and then the two black ones. So I want you to focus on here and then focus on the black one. It's all about a game of focus, about your, everyone's, uh, especially now, like everyone's after your attention and you have to be, you have to be able to control people's attention and where people are looking and w what's going on. And you do this with animations and shapes. So you've put this table and then you boom, you put your shape and then you're controlling, the, you're controlling the attention. Look there, look there. And then what you can do is you remove stuff as well. And then you use this. So you appear, stuff appears and stuff disappears. That's one way. And the other thing is, I don't know if you've noticed through the whole of these, of the, of the series, my bullet points, whenever I move from one bullet point to the next, it darkens. So can you see? So what's going on here? I said, I'm going to talk about animations. It goes white. And then boom, it, it goes dark. And then your attention immediately comes up to the table. Table changes, you're looking there. Table, table goes away. Kiss comes up. And that darkens as well. And then boom, your attention shifts to the right. So this, through, through this whole thing, I am I'm actually... Uh, guiding where your attention should be going, which is, which is very important because our attention is limited and, and everything. So I can show you two seconds how to do this. It's pretty simple. Um, there we go. So you can go to your animation panes, so animations, animation pane, panel, uh, whatever, and then you click your text and then you go after animation, you can have, I darkened it. So it's like more colors and, and you know, I pick a darker color. You can also hide it on next mouse click, which I do for like uh, the shapes. So I click it, the shape disappears. Yep, that's it. So moving on. So the kiss method, keep it simple, stupid. So you're going to describe a very complex procedure. Don't, uh, don't put everything on the slide immediately. Just appear chunks like I did in the writing. If you want to go back to, uh, to the writing part of this series where I just appeared each part as I was talking about it. For example, here, I wanted to explain, this is a very difficult concept to understand. It's how you print, you 3D bioprint in a, in a, in a, in a 3D medium, which is, which is a difficult concept to understand, but I didn't sit down and write the whole explanation. I just wrote down three stuff and I sat there and I got people to look at me, like I got people to look at me and I explained it because that's the whole point. That's why you're there to explain stuff. Um, and then your Viva. So your Viva is coming up and it's a 10 minute presentation. Uh, it was for me and you have to smash it. So what do you do? You practice. You've done your slides as we said. We discussed all the different stuff. Oh, one more point before I go to this. Sorry, I just remembered. Um, I tend to use dark colors. So white letters on dark backgrounds. I think that just makes it more memorable. Um, and I just prefer it. There's people that use white on black. Mostly people do that. I, I just, I don't like it. Um, so yeah. So as you can see, dark background, white letters. So going back to the practice part. So we're practicing our dissertation. You have to practice at least minimum 10 to 15 times your presentation. Minimum. I'd say if you want to be good at it, 15 to 20 times. Uh, the reason why you do this is because you have to be able to say it, not every time for it to be the same, but you have to develop these links in your mind that are going to help you going from one point to the next. These are so important because if you get stuck, you'll be able to uh, reignite yourself back on. So going from one point to the next or going from one slide to the next, what is going to be my linking word? So keep that in mind. And then the time. So I found out this the hard way. Thank God it wasn't in my dissertation, in my Viva, but this was for another project. I went over time for, I think, and I just got cut in the middle. It was like, I didn't even get to say my conclusion and I got marks deducted, etc. cetera. Um, so whenever I practice now, I always practice, say, I have to do the, the, 
the presentation for 10 minutes, I practice it for nine minutes. And the whole reason for that, why I'm doing it, is because when you're speaking, I come here and I speak, there's always gonna be a time where I'm either gonna stop for a bit, and or say something more because I'm excited and I'm passionate about the thing I'm talking about. So I'm giving myself a one minute uh, gap that I could, you know, play around with just to make sure I don't go over the time. So whenever you're practicing, at, um, I think at, at your last two, three practices, you can record yourself, which is an amazing way in order to see your body language, um, how you react, your hands, your uh, how are you sitting. I remember for, I used to do this for my interviews, when, whenever we teach interviews. Um, I always tell students to record themselves because they realize that when they're answering questions, either the posture is they're either slumping at the back or they're doing this or they're touching their face. Um, and, or maybe they're going, um, or doing those M's or, or their tone of their voice. And you, you get to understand so many stuff from recording yourself that you won't see if you don't do it and you don't see yourself. So do that and then review. And then you can also use, there's a few things here. One is, so we said about body language. There's also the tone of your voice, the speed that you're, speed, that, that you're speaking at. You've realized that through this whole thing, I've been speaking pretty fast to be honest, but if you want to emphasize a specific point, then you slow down and then your audience also remembers that point even more. So record yourself. Supplementary slides. This is a pretty cheeky point, but I really like it. It's like a hack. But at the end of your Viva, people are going to ask you questions. They're gonna, <laughs> uh, people, you, the, the scientists that are gonna be looking at you, they're gonna ask you questions. And they're there, they're gonna grill you. Like this is, this is gonna happen. It's not, it's something that's going to happen. And they're gonna try and grill you as much as they can because they wanna see how much of an expert you are in that field and how, if you can think on your feet. So there's, there's, there's a way to, to, get, to get over this and to make this easier for you. What I do with all my presentations, to be honest, like not even Uvive, like other presentations as well, I do supplementary slides. So I make more slides than I need, usually when I'm doing the presentation. And then all the slides that I remove at the end because, of, because I've practiced and I've seen, oh, I don't have the time to do this, and I put them at the end, I use them when I'm answering questions because usually those slides are the stuff that you've kind of left out. And this, you can even do this on purpose. You can leave stuff out on purpose so you can guide people to ask you on that stuff. It's again, I'm, might sound bad, but I'm actually manipulating the questions that I'm going to be asked because I'm leaving some stuff out on purpose, which are, you're not gonna leave out stuff that's important. You're gonna leave stuff that's as low to medium importance out. And people will ask you on that stuff. And then you're gonna be like, um, yeah, I can answer that question. Go to your supplementary slides. Go to the slide that you've already prepared on that thing and then answer it on that thing. And people will be impressed, trust me. People are impressed. When, when they ask you a question and you've already got a slide ready for it and then you talk over the slide, that's pretty impressive. So you can use this, um, yeah. And then the other thing is you can make, you can show the recordings of yourself to other people or they can see you do the presentation and then let them ask you questions. And the questions they ask you, they're the ones that your examiners will probably, uh, will probably go down that path as well. And if you do this quite a few times, you really, <laughs> you have most, most of the questions that you're gonna be asked, you're gonna already know from, the, from before. So, you've done this and you're ready for your, for your presentation, you've got a nice thesis, you've got a nice uh, publishable uh, dissertation, and you go around finding conferences. This is gonna help you as well, like build it, build up, and then this is good experience, especially for medical students, you get points later for like your applications and stuff. Find conferences, you use social media, these are some of the accounts that I use to find some conferences, and then you can also ask your supervisors, which are experts in the field, so ask them, what do you think a conference I could go to, and then, you submit to those conferences an abstract, which is background, aim, methods, results, conclusion. Big point here, you don't have to have a ready manuscript to submit an abstract. You can submit an abstract without your full manuscript. You have to have your results, of course, and your conclusion at, to some point, so you can be able to write your abstract, but you don't need a full manuscript. So the abstract you submit is usually 250 to 300 words, 
And that's about it. What else do we have? So you've done your, you've gone to your conferences, you've talked about your paper, people love it, and then you're like, I'm gonna publish it. Um, and yeah, so this is, this is, this is the approach I, I take when I'm trying to publish something. I go from the, so I, I, I write down four journals, four or five journals that I like, that, are, that have something to do with my paper. And they are, go from high impact factor to a lower impact factor. Basically means they are the good ones and towards, and then going down and then falling in, in quality. And then you, I send it to the best one. So I go and I, I go high, like I go to the best I can find, which is, I'm probably gonna get rejected. Like who am I? I'm probably gonna get rejected, but Whatever happens, if I get rejected or if I get accepted, it's a win-win situation. Why? If I get rejected, then I've, I've had some of the best reviewers, because I've gone to the best journal, review my article and tell me exactly what's wrong with it with some actionable ways to solve it. What else can you ask for? It's, you're gonna get the best feedback ever. And then you get that feedback and then you fix it and then you send it to the other. Uh, and then you send it to the next journal on your list. Big point to keep in mind here, average publishing acceptance rate is 32%. So I'd wait for definitely two, three rejections be before I get something published. It might be exceptional, you might get it from the first time. Well done, but yeah. And I think this brings us to the end. Thank you so much for watching. Um, if you enjoyed these, please consider subscribing. It makes a big difference. Please comment. Um, this is important. Comment and put feedback in the comments. The reason why I've done these the series is because I've actually given these lectures to students in UCL in third year, and I've gotten back feedback which was which I was very surprised by, which is very good. Uh, yeah, they very they enjoyed it. They got a lot of it, and I was like, because I got that feedback, that kind of that motivated me to do this and put it outside, etc. So if if there's something that you want to know or if you like this etc say it and then you basically motivate us in order to make more content that's going to be helpful hopefully for you guys if it's not helpful say it <laughs> and uh, give us a like that helps as well that's about it and all the institutions you could see them yeah thank you <laughs>